Someone knows who this individual is. Someone knows who this individual is. Is it a family member? Is it a neighbor? Is it an acquaintance? Is it an associate? Or maybe that one guy that lives over at that one place that just kind of not right. Maybe it's his jeans. Maybe it's his jacket or his sweatshirt. Maybe it's his shirt tail. Maybe it's his posture. Maybe it's the right hand in his pocket. I would have never heard of Delphi, Indiana, if it were not for the depraved actions of one individual on a sunny afternoon in February 2017. I wouldn't know the names Abigail Williams and Liberty German. My heart wouldn't ache for these girls, and my blood wouldn't boil over the fact that their killer has still not been brought to justice five years later. You see, it was a sunny day in the Midwest, unseasonably warm for February, and even though the 13th was a Monday, it was a planned administrative day off school. So best friends and eighth graders, Abby and Libby, had a sleepover the night before. The next morning, they ate pancakes for breakfast and arranged for Libby's big sister to drop them off at a local hiking trail in town at around 1.40 in the afternoon. But when the girls failed to meet Libby's dad at their planned pickup location around 3.15, he became extremely worried and began searching the area. The girls were reported missing around 5.20 p.m., and a massive search ensued. Hundreds of volunteers from the community came out to help in the search for the girls, but nerves began to escalate as darkness fell and temperatures began to drop. The search was actually called off around midnight in a controversial decision, um, citing concerns for volunteer safety because the terrain of the area is uh, very rough and kind of hard to navigate, especially in the dark. So law enforcement did make the decision um, to call the search off and postpone it till the next morning. The following day was Valentine's Day, and at around 12.15 in the afternoon, the bodies of the girls were discovered in a wooded area on the edge of a private property, just about 50 feet up from the bank of Deer Creek. Law enforcement has not released information on the details of the crime scene, including causes of death, though the scene itself has been described as odd and with distinct characteristics or signatures, leading many to believe this was likely the work of either someone who had killed before and or would most likely kill again. We know the motivation of the crime is sexual and homicidal ideation, um, and we know that these girls' last minutes on Earth were that of sheer terror and brutality. But we also know a little bit more about this killer, thanks to the quick-witted thinking and bravery of Libby, who had her phone in her hand and began recording when she felt uneasy as the suspect approached them. She was able to give us both video and audio of her killer in her most terrifying moment. Through cryptic messaging, vague allusions to religious themes, and appeals to the subject's conscious by law enforcement, we are able to establish a few things about the suspect profile. They have confirmed he is between the ages of 18 and 40, um, and is believed to be from or very familiar with the area. In the words of Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter, he has likely told someone what he has done, or at the very least, someone in his life suspects him due to how different he has been since the murders, um, likely due to a change in behavior or appearance. This is about power to him, and he likely attends the press conferences and or attempts to play a role in the investigation. Law enforcement has suggested that the public will be shocked to learn what they know, and they seem to allude to this person being of prominence and power within the community. Many credit the lack of an arrest after five long years to law enforcement's incompetence and apparent misjudgments along the way. And trust me, I will definitely have things to say when everything is brought to light. But at this moment, I have to have hope for Abby and Libby and trust what law enforcement is confidently saying is true. We are just one piece away from an arrest. What I think a lot of people tend to overlook in this case is that in order to make an arrest, law enforcement needs to believe that they have enough evidence for a conviction. They know they cannot mess this up 
any more than they already have. And because this is likely a death penalty case, I can kind of understand the hesitancy in making an arrest. So it begs the question, is law enforcement just waiting around for a member of the public to have an epiphany and identify this guy? In my opinion, no. They are waiting on somebody who's got some skin in this game, somebody close to the killer to come forward, go on record, and who would be willing to testify and perhaps poke some holes in their alibi and testify to a behavioral change after the murders or anything else they may know or be suspicious of. That, to me, would fill in the gaps that could be reasonable doubt as to, you know, whether law enforcement's person of interest is the guy on the bridge or not. So I think having somebody who is close to this person provide that sort of endorsement would make a huge difference in terms of the courtroom setting. But of course, that's just my speculation as to what this missing link could possibly be. Um, it seems everybody on the internet has a different opinion. And while law enforcement, of course, is has a right to be vague and withhold information, we as the public also have a right to speculate and you know, communicate our opinions in a way that is respectful and responsible. Because we as the public have a responsibility to look out for each other and especially our most vulnerable members. And when such atrocities like this happen in our public spaces in broad daylight, we must hold the appropriate agencies accountable for securing justice and getting this motherfucker off the streets.